Hello and welcome back. In this Black Excellence presentation, we will highlight 10 Black artists who help break barriers in the visual art arena. Welcome to BlackExcellence.com, the site where we share Black excellence, opulence, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. African American artists have helped shape the visual culture of the United States by working outside of the convention of their respective fields while defying discrimination and professional stereotypes, often channeling their familial backgrounds and personal experiences in their work. These creative figures have influenced and inspired much of American art's evolution. Collectively, their bodies of work should not only be seen as a narrative of the African American experience of their time, but also a powerful expression of cultural protest. Unfortunately, throughout history, both in the United States and beyond, artists of color have not aptly been recognized for their talents, achievements, and contributions. However, contemporary audiences are becoming increasingly interested in diversity in the arts, prompting museums, libraries, and other cultural institutions to shine an overdue spotlight on the work of African American artists. In this original Black Excellence video, we will be featuring 10 Black artists who have left enduring legacies in American history. So without further ado, let's get started. Number one, Gordon Parks, photographer and director. In 1912, Gordon Parks was born in a poor segregated Kansas town. After sifting through a magazine and seeing photos of migrant workers, Parks bought his own camera at the age of 25, putting him on course to become the most prolific self-taught black photographer of his time. Having captured images of inner city life in Chicago, in 1941, Parks won a fellowship sponsored by the Farm Security Administration, documenting social conditions in America. He produced some of his most enduring works there, depicting how racism affected social and economic issues. He also started freelancing for Vogue, entering the world of glamour photography and producing a distinctive style of action-oriented poses of models in their apparel. In 1948, Park's photo essay of the life of a Harlem gang leader led him to a staff position at Life magazine, the preeminent photographic periodical in the country. For the next 20 years, he captured images in a multitude of genres, including celebrity portraits of civil rights activists Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, and Stokely Carmichael. But Parks wasn't interested in limiting his talents. He expanded his lens into Hollywood in 1969 and became the first black director of a major motion picture, The Learning Tree, his own autobiography. His next film, Shaft, became one of the biggest hits of 1971 and launched what would be known as black exploitation films. Number two, Jean Michael Basquiat, painter. Before Brooklyn native Jean-Michael Basquiat became a world-renowned neo-expressionist painter, he was tagging subway trains under the graffiti artist's name, Samo. To make ends meet, he sold apparel and postcards featuring his street art. But Basquiat wouldn't struggle for too long. After his art was featured in a group exhibit, Basquiat's painting career took off. His artwork often included his crown motif, a celebration of black power. He also used social dichotomies, appropriated text and images, and included historical elements in his paintings to express contemporary criticisms. Beginning in the mid-1980s, he began collaborating with Andy Warhol, and within a short time, a Basquiat original was selling for $50,000 a piece. But as his fame took him to new heights, so did his addiction to drugs. Unfortunately, the world lost an artistic genius at the age of 27 when he died of a heroin overdose. In 2017, Basquiat joined the Rare Field $100 million Plus Club when his powerful 1982 painting of a skull brought in $110.5 million, becoming the sixth most expensive work ever sold at auction. Number three, James Van Der Zee, photographer. Born in 1886 in Massachusetts, James Van Der Zee would make his way to Harlem, New York as a celebrated photographer, capturing middle-class black family life during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 30s like no other photographer before him. Taking mostly indoor portraits in a commercial studio environment, Van Der Zee served his fellow residents by photographing them for weddings as well as team, 
family, and funeral portraits. He also famously snapped black celebrity figures. Starting around the 1950s, Van Der Zee experienced a second wave of popularity when the Metropolitan Museum of Art hosted a photographic exhibition, Harlem On My Mind, which featured his works. He became an in-demand photographer once again, collaborating with the likes of Jean-Michael Basquiat, Cicely Tyson, and Lou Rawls. Before his death in 1983, Van Der Zee established his own institute and was bestowed the Living Legacy Award by President Jimmy Carter. Number four, Augusta Savage, sculptor. When Augusta Savage was a little girl, she used the clay found naturally in her native home of Green Coast Springs, Florida to shape small figurines. Despite her dad beating her to prevent her from sculpting, Savage kept pursuing her bliss, and in 1915, she won a prize for her sculptures at a county fair. Encouraged by the fair superintendent to study art, Savage continued working on her dream. Savage moved to New York City in the 1920s and studied art at Cooper Union. She excelled academically, graduated early, and then applied for a summer program in France. However, she discovered she was rejected for being black. She disputed the committee's decision, contacting local newspapers to shed light on the discrimination. Despite her protest, she was not allowed into the summer program. Ultimately, opportunities began opening up anyway, and soon she became one of the most prominent artists of the Harlem Renaissance. Her busts of Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, and one partially based on her nephew, which she entitled Gaiman, enhanced her reputation. She would earn multiple fellowships in the coming years, which finally opened the doors to her studying and traveling abroad. Other career-defining works include her 16-foot-tall The Harp, which was featured at the New York World's Fair in 1939, and The Pugilist in 1942. Number five, Jacob Lawrence, painter. Raised in Harlem, Jacob Lawrence grew up attending museums and participating in art workshops. In 1937, he enrolled at the American Artist School in New York on scholarship, and by the time he graduated, he had already crafted his own personal style of modernism, depicting African American life in vivid color. By the age of 25, he became nationally famous for his migration series in 1941, and after serving in World War II, he produced war series in 1946, thus establishing himself as the most famous black painter of the 20th century. After suffering from a period of depression in the late 1940s, Lawrence turned his efforts to teaching and accepted a position at the University of Washington, where he would teach for 15 years. He also spent his time working on commissioned paintings and contributing works to nonprofits like the Children's Defense Fund and the NAACP. Number six, Edmonia Lewis, sculptor. Born around 1844 in Greenbush, New York, Edmonia Lewis hailed from African American and Native American ancestry, becoming the first professional sculptor representing both communities and the only black female of the era recognized in the American art scene. After graduating from Oberlin College, Lewis found her way to Boston, where she met sculptor and mentor-to-be Edward A. Brackett and abolitionist William Lord Garrison. After setting up her own studio, Lewis began creating plaster medallions of famous abolitionists, starting in the early 1860s, but it was her 1864 bust of Civil War hero, Colonel Robert Shaw, who led the African-American 54th Massachusetts Regiment, that brought her national prominence. With the funds she earned from the copy she made of the Shaw bust, Lewis furthered her craft in Rome, sculpting in neoclassical style, where she was celebrated for works like Arrow Maker, a sculpture of a Native American father teaching his daughter how to shape an arrow, and Forever Free, a piece that emotionally captures two black slaves encountering freedom for the first time. Along with her bust of American presidents Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant and works that paid homage to her Catholic faith, Lewis was also known for her marble depiction of Cleopatra called The Death of Cleopatra, which was on display at the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876. Number seven, Lorna Simpson, photographer. Born in Brooklyn, New York, Lorna Simpson is a photographer known for exploring questions around race, culture, gender, identity, and memory. 
oftentimes using black women as the subjects of her art. After graduating with a BFA in photography from the School of Visual Arts in New York and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego, Simpson built her career in the mid-1980s with her large-scale conceptual photo textile, which featured text superimposed onto portrait images. In the 90s, she began incorporating multi-paneled images onto felt, taking on adult themes, and became the first black woman to be featured at the Venice Bienno. In the the new millennium, Simpson turned to video installations to express herself in a new refreshing way. In addition to her art being featured in galleries and museums all over the world, the Whitney Museum in New York City held a 20-year retrospective of her work in 2007. Since then, Simpson has collaborated with rapper Common to create his 2016 album cover for Black America Again, and the following year worked with Vogue on a series of portraits showcasing professional women and their passion for art. Number eight, Kara Walker, painter and silhouettist. Fascinated with black history, gender stereotypes, and identity, Kara Walker always knew she would be an artist, but she didn't know the controversy it would bring. After graduating from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1994, Walker launched her career using the theme of black slavery expressed through violent imagery. At the age of 27, she became one of the youngest recipients of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, and in 2007, Time Magazine included her on its Time 100 list for her subversive and mockingly defiant approach to race and racism in her art. While many institutions around the world have been thrilled to exhibit her work, Walker has encountered her fair share of critics who interpret her creations as furthering black stereotypes. Some black artists have protested her work, while others have publicly denounced it as pandering to the white community. In addition to producing a variety of commissioned work, she's taught extensively at Columbia University, and in 2015, began serving as Tepper Chair in Visual Arts at Rutgers University. Number nine, E. Sims Campbell, illustrator. Born in St. Louis, Missouri, E. Sims Campbell would rise to become the first African-American syndicated illustrator in the country. Having studied at the Lewis Institute, University of Chicago and Art Institute, Campbell continued to hone his craft, taking art and design classes while juggling odd jobs. After working at a St. Louis art studio and a New York ad agency, Campbell illustrated Langston Hughes and Arna Bonatemps' children's book, Popo and Fafina, Children of Haiti. His claim to fame, though, started in 1933, when he became a resident illustrator at Esquire, where he spent the next two plus decades helping shape the brand. He was known for his drawings of white upper-class characters and pinup models, creating the character Eski, the magazine's bulging-eyed mascot, and his syndicated cartoon strip, Cuties. Number 10, Horace Pippin, Painter. Born in 1888 in Pennsylvania, Horace Pippin was a self-taught painter known for his depictions of the black experience ranging from slavery to abolition to segregation, as well as for his religious imagery and landscapes. Pippin showed artistic promise early in his youth, but when World War I came calling, the direction of his life was temporarily stalled. A bullet wound on the battlefield left him unable to use his right arm. Using a poker to elevate his arm, Pippin retaught himself how to draw and paint, producing dozens of works in folk art style. In 1938, his works were exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, along with several self-portraits. Pippin has been noted for genre paintings like Domino Players, 1943, and Harmonizing, 1944, as well as biblical scenes like Christ and the Woman of Samaria, 1940. His life and works have been curated at various art institutions, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and the Smithsonian Institution. We appreciate the fact that you stayed with us until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss a video. Bye for now. We will see you tomorrow.